Latitude Media, podcast at the frontier of climate technology. I'm Shail Khan, and this is Catalyst. All of these companies, by the way, are starting with scrap because there's just not enough. Uh, and what I mean, that scrap coming off of manufacturing lines for batteries. There's not enough batteries entering the uh, recycling uh, uh, ecosystem at end of life yet. We hope scrap rates go down because they're wasteful, but we also hope batteries last a long time. So there's going to be a bit of a lean period before they can be fully engaged in recycling. Give us your poor, your degraded, your end-of-life batteries yearning to be recycled. Let's face it, environmental news is often very depressing. That's why we focus on solutions on this podcast. But still, the climate crisis looms large. Rising temperatures, mounting pollution, environmental degradation, they're all warping the planet. And for a lot of species, including us, things don't always look so great. But the story doesn't end there. Every Friday, Living Planet, a show from Deutsche Welle, takes you behind the headlines to figure out what's happening and how we'll get through it. It'll also help you make better choices for a healthy planet and find space to reconnect with the beauty and wonder of the world around us. You can find Living Planet wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Shail Khan. I invest in revolutionary climate technologies at Energy Impact Partners. Welcome. All right, so a few weeks ago, in one of my World Decarbonization Tour episodes that I did with Nat Bullard, we briefly discussed battery recycling and specifically talked about how it appears there's going to be a pretty huge oversupply of recycling capacity relative to the number of recyclable batteries in coming years. In other words, not a great time to be a battery recycling company and especially challenging to be a subscale one. But a bunch of you reached out to point out something correct, which is that not all battery recycling capacity is equal, and some of that capacity might have more real legs than others. And fair enough, I realized actually we've never really talked about the technology of battery recycling here. So let's rectify that. For this one, I brought on Dr. Dan Steingart. Dan is the chair of the Earth Environmental Engineering Department at Columbia, and as you will hear, has thought a lot about battery recycling from a process engineering standpoint, as well as from a business standpoint. Here's Dan. Dan, welcome. Uh, Thanks for having me. Let's talk about battery recycling. Starting with the basics. So uh, there's an end-of-life battery, whatever kind of battery. It's an EV battery. It's a battery from some tool, whatever it is. Um, Can you just walk us through the the steps in the process to recycle its components? Sure thing. So... You know, there's already differentiation when the cell is delivered to wherever it's it's going to be recycled. The first thing the recycler has to ask itself is, does it need to discharge the the cell or not? Uh, When cells come in, uh, they may be charged, uh, they may be discharged, they're likely somewhere in between zero and 100. Um, Importantly, there's still uh, flammable components in some degree of of energization inside of it. Um, a big concern that, that we've seen in, in, in my lab is uh, 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 what's called dead lithium, or I like to call it zombie lithium, uh, because it comes back and, and bites you in moments that, that you don't expect. And this is lithium metal that's deposited um, inappropriately in a lithium ion battery. And what that means is in a lithium ion battery, there's not supposed to be any lithium metal. As cells degrade, as cells get older, particularly as, as we ask them to charge faster, there's more of this stuff. And so uh, uh, recyclers have to contend with what the, the latent energy is or, or the, the remaining uh, active chemical energy uh, that's in the cell. Ideally, they would just like to chew up the cell uh, and turn it into what we call a, a black mass. So let, let's assume that, that they, uh, one way or the other, either discharge the cell or allowed for a little bit of a, a combustion in their consumption process. And they will typically just take the cells and shred them completely. And I guess before we get, you're starting at the sort of like, what do you do with the cell? But there's a step before the cell, right? Like there's a, there's a disassembly component as well. Yeah, no, excellent point. So, so Cells come in typically welded packs, uh, and and each pack has its own design. And so the recycler has to have an understanding of of where the cells sit, how the cells sit in the pack, and and a means to unweld or mechanically remove the cells from that pack without 
breaking or reducing the integrity of, of the cell itself. In this mechanical disassembly process, uh, you don't want to have something that, that eats into the, the cell itself. And so the way to think about this is, is most of your uh, listeners probably know that a uh, Tesla has something like 8,000 plus cells inside of it. Uh, when uh, that pack would be disassembled, you don't want to break the integrity of the individual unit as you take it apart. And so these cells have to be taken out and separated from the rest of the pack and, and module assembly. The degree to which these cells are then checked and sorted for remaining life, I think, is is questionable. There, there is some interest um, with good intention to have a, a second life for some of these cells. Maybe some of them are still good. Maybe some of them are, are still useful. It's typically pretty pretty difficult to justify the cost of grading these cells and estimating their their second life. We do a fair bit of that in my lab, and I have to say to date, I think that that it's probably not a bankable effort yet. I'm not sure that even if we had perfect metrology to understand the second life of cells, we would actually want to put them into that application. So once the cells are removed from the pack, uh, they're then uh, put directly into this digestion process. Okay, so they're put into this digestion process. How then do you get from there to extracting the valuable components of the cell? Yeah, so there's two processes, and they're identical to the uh, ancestor processes in mining um, in the same way we would act on an ore. And so at a very high level, um, the very cheap but very dirty method is called pyrometallurgy, where you just start to burn things and let whatever uh, nasty gases evolve that will will evolve. And, and typically in, in 2024, we have to use fossil fuels to heat the pyrometallurgical process, although there could be some exothermic combinations from just heating the cell itself. Uh, but the off-gassing is so nasty that that in the United States, we basically don't want to do any, any pyrometallurgy anymore. It's not to say that there isn't a lot of pyrometallurgy. There's plenty in China and India and, and, and other parts of the world. But basically, you, you heat the cell uh, components up. It's, again, a homogenized mass. Uh, this is called a black mass. And then you go into a process by which you um, begin to, to separate the components out. And it's identical to uh, the processes one would use in mining. You would use physical separation and flotation methods as, as much as possible, as those, those are cheapest. And then uh, where you need to put in alloys and fluxes to get out specific chemicals, you, you, you would do this in a, in a, in a, a, a molten state. Okay, so that's a pyrometallurgical process. And, and so, yeah, in... in virgin ore mining, uh, you do concentration and flotation, you get an ore concentrate, and then you smelt it, which is the burned fossil fuels, super high degree temperature, you know, lots of, uh, lots of off gases, lots of problems. We don't really build any new smelters in the United States, as you said, across the board, including for battery recycling, but they do in some other parts of the world. And so that's how a lot of ore ultimately gets processed. You said that's the cheap but dirty version. My understanding is it's cheap. It's, it may be overall cheap, but it's pretty capital intensive. Like smelters, concentration and smelting are both really high capex, worth billions of dollars of capex per unit. They are, um, but they give you a, a guaranteed result, and it is uh, generally cheaper than the cousin that, that I like more, which is hydrometallurgy, in my experience, or at least in my conversations with, with Chinese recyclers. In, in China, where there are uh, fewer local restrictions on having pyro in certain provinces, pyro is, uh, as I understand it now, um, the majority of, of recycling methods. Okay, so let's talk about the other then, which is hydrometallurgy. So, so in hydrometallurgy, and, and I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of hydrometallurgy, um, uh, rather than um, take things to high temperature, you basically take the black mass and uh, digest it in uh, a series of acids. And, and what acid you digest the black mass in is a bit different from traditional mining. In mining, it's typically sulfuric acid. Every once in a while, it's hydrochloric acid. And in mining... Um, this is the the most environmentally uh, damaging part of the process because you build up these massive piles and you soak them in sulfuric acid for for months at a time. The residence time, for example, of a, of a copper leach pile is on the order of, of uh, three months. The capital intensity 
to your point, Shell, of, of doing that for, for batteries would be, would be way high. And so what re- most recyclers use now for hydro met, uh, digestion is, is a combination of sulfuric acid with uh, hydrogen peroxide for, for a bit of kick, uh, H2O2. And, and this, <laughs> this is really nasty stuff. It's called piranha because it eats through anything. And, and uh, it reduces the residence time from about 90 days to just a few hours. Um, but handling uh, the piranha is, is a significant challenge. But it allows the process to be far more portable than it would be in a standard hydrometallurgical process. So rather than need to have this big leach pit uh, that takes up a huge amount of space and, and, and creates local environmental contamination, uh, you can do it in, in a closed reactor vessel in a warehouse um, and, and no one outside would, would be the wiser assuming that the, the uh, waste is handled properly. After this point, you either do uh, a series of pH swings where you understand what metals are in your, your, your mix and swing the pH up. So we're starting with an acid, so we're at a very low pH. We add sodium hydroxide to this carefully so that we precipitate out certain uh, metals in a certain order. Every metal has a different point at which it wants to precipitate as we swing up and, and we can take advantage of this process to, to get it out. This is imperfect. This is the cheapest way of doing things, but but this is imperfect as metals speciate, means they, they mix in solution in different quantities. Um, a process that 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 I'm uh, in the minority, I think, in the field, but I think is something that needs further work because I think it's a beautiful process is, is solvent extraction, where organic ligands are designed to specifically target certain metals, and you can create complex circuits that target certain metals in in a certain order to uh, uh, extract, concentrate, and then refine uh, sulfate solutions that can then be be valorized later on. Uh, SX processes are uh, typically used in, in copper extraction in the mining industry. That's where most of them were, were developed. But now uh, there's a lot of value in using them in, in nickel and gold and anything basically more, more valuable than copper on the, the London Metals Exchange. For, for metals like zinc, precipitation is still dominant, but, but there's a lot of academic work trying to make solvent extraction uh, work, work for that as well. What's nice about about solvent extraction and, and why I'm a big fan of it, and, and you can do this in precipitation as well, is that what you're left with is is a metal sulfate. And this is exactly what battery companies want for recreating, uh, in particular, the cathode material. So uh, you need to get to a sulfate anyway when you're making uh, uh, the chemical through, through, through pyro. And so I think it's disadvantage there. And in the United States and in most Western countries, the recycling efforts you see are rooted in a hydro uh, metal stance. Different companies process it in different ways. And in general, to your earlier point, to reduce CapEx, you want to uh, use as, as much of a precipitation process in 2024 as possible because you just, you just need fewer reactors and fewer reagents and, and, and less complex loops. In my experience, though, and, and um, I, I invite any of your listeners to come at me with knives, I think that um, Running steady state solvent extraction has much lower OPEX. I've I've been to a few copper plants, and um, 20 years ago there were a lot of uh, uh, there was a lot of maintenance and a lot of folks walking up and down the miles and miles of solvent extraction lines or or extraction loops, making sure they were working. I visited a a, a mine in Morency, Arizona, a couple years ago. The same one I'd visited 20 years ago. And there was almost nobody uh, having to walk up and down the process. It just ran by itself uh, with maybe daily uh, checks to make sure that that pHs were were in in the right place. Um, so so you know, very very long story here, but I think that um, um, within the world of uh, hydrometallurgy, there is a a lot of blue ocean for solvent extraction. I've spent a bunch of time on copper as well, and similarly, like solvent extraction now is I think of it as mostly a solved problem. It's like, it, it works really well. Um, and that's part of what has made the hydrometallurgical path for copper refining more attractive over time. Okay, so we have these two high-level paths, pyro and hydrometallurgy, um, trade-offs amongst them, and some nuances within each category. Let's just talk about the landscape that exists today. Who are the big battery recyclers? And where are they and which path are they taking? Right. So so I'm going to focus on three that, that I have some familiarity with because I've looked at their, their flow sheets and their patents. There, there are many out there and, and many I don't know. So I, I just want to be clear to your listeners that it's, it's a pretty competitive space. In China, 
there's probably 50, 50 to 100 easy at different points in the tech stack. But the three um, we can talk about today, uh, because I, I think they, they represent three interesting shades of uh, hydrometallurgy upstream and downstream, are redwood, redwood materials, ascend elements, and life cycle. Uh, they've all capitalized to significant extents in the United States. Um, I would say that redwood, in both its design and its aspirations, wants to be the mine of the future. They, they really see that uh, uh, the main value of uh, recycling is not the process, but the input material. Uh, you can control the value of the output, the downstream material, as much as you'd like, but you're going to have massive margin pressure from, from all the battery suppliers who are fashion, facing uh, massive margin pressure from, from their OEMs, right? So I think that, that Redwood is taking an approach where it is trying to consolidate as much of the recycled material at a, um, uh, at a commodity uh, level as possible. And so they're, uh, uh, as I understand it, starting with, with um, all of these companies, by the way, are starting with scrap because there's just not enough uh, and what I mean, that scrap coming off of manufacturing lines for batteries. There's not enough batteries entering the uh, recycling uh, ecosystem at end of life yet. Uh, so these problems of digestion that we started the conversation with are problems that will be at scale in the future. Currently, all three of these companies are living off of gigafactory scrap, which is exceptionally high, uh, over over 20%, as I understand it. I, I worry about the business case here because the, the gigafactories have every incentive in the world to minimize this amount of scrap. And so uh, at the same time, we don't want batteries to die. So every recycler is going to have a um, lean period <laughs> as scrap rates go down. We hope scrap rates go down because they're wasteful, but we also hope batteries last a long time. So there's going to be a bit of a lean period before they can be fully engaged in recycling. I think Redwood is establishing itself as the place where batteries go to die so they can be, be reprocessed. Uh, they are using a fairly traditional uh, hydromet stack as, as, as far as I can tell. In terms of, uh, on the opposite end, in terms of innovating on a, a well-understood process, Ascend Elements is, uh, uh, has something they call hydro to cathode. That's a, a process in which they uh, cleverly don't use solvent extraction because they say, hey, most of what the battery looks like uh, and the material that we need to have looks a lot like what the battery coming in has. So why go through this process of separating out all of the metals once we've cleaned things out? In particular, these cathodes have uh, nickel, uh, manganese, and cobalt. The ratio of, of nickel to manganese to cobalt is changing, and so this a little bit of nickel makeup or a lot of nickel makeup has to be added. But, but Ascend sees a pathway where they're focusing downstream and produces uh, actual precursor for cathode, and then eventually a cathode material because the value of cathode materials is the highest of it all. For what it's worth, I believe Redwood is also going that far downstream, but you're saying through a different process. I think so. I don't know. I mean, so so uh, Ascend has has IP around this direct hydro to cathode process. And and to be clear, yes, it's, it's my understanding that Redwood wants to you know cut out the the middleman uh, uh, cathode manufacturer and go straight to cathode uh, manufacturing as well. I think that that Ascend has spent, at least in terms of their marketing, and I think in terms of their tech stack, more time focusing on, on how one valorizes the input stream faster and more efficiently. Okay, so you're saying, you know, all things equal, Redwood is sort of really focused on this getting feedstock, and winning the feedstock battle, which, for what it's worth, I think is a, a probably a smart thing to do, <laughs> because I, I agree, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're saying Ascend has has spent a lot of time focused on this hydro to cathode bit. Um, what about life cycle? So life cycle is is uh, the real politic of the three. Uh, life cycle is born from Hatch DNA. Hatch has been making mining electro uh, ex ex primary extraction electro winning equipment for for a very long time. And uh, Lifecycle says the world wants sulfate, uh, metal sulfates, excuse me, as a commodity. 
and uh, we should focus on the best possible processes to create the digesters to focus on the battery inputs as they are. So uh, what I mean by real politic is it, they're not trying to necessarily disrupt the way the battery industry works, but rather make a, a, a product that the cathode manufacturers already know how to deal with, so they have the broadest possible customer base, and use their mining roots to digest the ore in a reasonable fashion, as I understand it, using a mixture of, of precipitation processes and, and solvent extraction. So, so they are the the uh, conservative. I think is not fair to them. I think I think they're taking the world as it is, as opposed to as they as they want it to be. Let's talk for a minute, stepping back from just these three players, about the unit economics of battery recycling. What are the things that really drive the value? Like, if you're if you're a recycler, obviously, what you're getting out is the materials from the battery. What, relatively speaking drives your profitability or lack thereof. For example, you mentioned like a lot of these, the cathodes that are being recycled right now are mostly NMC. Um, you know, nickel is a big portion of that value. And of course, nickel prices have crashed and the nickel market is um, struggling at the moment. So how much does that, for example, affect the unit economics of battery recycling and what has to be true about your the cost of your input or the cost of your process to, to make this profitable? Well, you, you've hit on it Exactly right. And I agree with this 100%. You have to beat the LMX on your eventual price of a, of a sulfate to be um, a, a competitor for Alibaba or whatever your benchmark price is. Uh, nickel drove most of the deal flow in, in 21, 22, 23. And as you said, <laughs> nickel prices have crashed. Look, we've seen this story before, even before recycling was a, a challenge. Um, uh, when I started my academic career in 09 and 10, um, the nickel prices were pushing the world to LFP uh, once before. <laughs> and then nickel prices crashed in the early teens, and we had um, all this wonderful NMC coming online. And and then uh, uh, the world saw nickel prices spike, and so uh, and so LFP swung back, and now LFP is safer and easier to source. So LFP seems to be here to stay for a little bit, but um, nickel once again is cheap. And so, what does that ultimately mean for for uh, recycling? I think the the brutal truth is is that it's a cost center, and that inputs recycled inputs are ultimately a tolling operation unless Redwood can pull off owning the supply. Because if Redwood can pull off owning the supply, then it owns the mine of the future, which are these terawatt hours of, of spent batteries. How a Redwood or, you know, and any three, any one of these three can begin to capitalize towards having battery warehouses for spent batteries. But uh, Tesla already controls the uh, uh, end result in many ways of, it, of its batteries. Um, when GM and Ford and Stellantis, when, when it becomes more of their output, uh, they're going to want to control this as well. And so what entitlements recyclers have to controlling that that upstream feedstock is, is going to be a, a bit brutal. And at the same time, all recyclers then at the end of history are, are in a very tight position because their customer is also their supplier. Um, and so uh, they're ultimately tollers and they're forced to win on the efficiency of their process. And we've seen this game before in all process metallurgy. Once the winner shakes out, then margin pressure on these folks will be, will be enormous. So, so ultimately, uh, recyclers are, are going to have to be built in as either a partner toller where they're just guaranteed feedstock to live and they just, they just have to make sure they're processing at, at uh, an optimum ways for as long as possible, or they become part of the uh, uh, manufacturing chain as well. And so uh, Northvolt has uh, a lot of interesting IP on recycling. I think they call their recycling effort Revolt. And I, I want to point out that uh, my lab has some funding um, to Northvolt, so we're, we're very thankful uh, for that. But uh, Northvolt sees a future where recycling is part of the manufacturing process to, to begin with. So this is a, a long and winding answer to your question of, 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 of where is the value. The value is on, on guaranteeing input for your, uh, uh, the batteries that, that, that you need independent of the vagaries of the metals markets and, and your input markets when you're, getting, uh, when you're, when you're needing terawatt hours uh, worth of energy stored. What about LFP? I mean, 
as you mentioned, the sort of world has turned toward and back from LFP, but it, but it, it is a significant portion of batteries these days. So we have fewer of them getting recycled because LFP hasn't been around in large volume for a long time, but it will be clearly. And just, you know, a, a, as a reminder, an MC is nickel manganese cobalt. Uh, LFP is lithium iron phosphate. And, uh, you know, it's not hard to understand why LFP is generally cheaper because that list of things is generally lower cost than the list of things that goes into NMC. That's the value of LFP, right? It comes at an energy density cost. However, the decision has been made in some applications, that's worth it. But from a battery recycling perspective, strikes me that that makes it an even bigger challenge because where on on the NMC side, you know, the value of your output, whether it is the sulfates or you're going all the way to to PCAM or cathode active materials themselves, contains high value things. I mean, nickel prices are down, but they are still, you know, orders of magnitude above iron, for example. So what does it look like to recycle LFP? Yeah, so so using any of the methods we spoke of to date, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, the lithium is the most valuable thing, followed by uh, the phosphorus. And the phosphorus is, is really valuable looking f- forward to future of phosphates, given how environmentally nasty uh, phosphorus extraction is. But but on a recycle market now, recycling phosphorus doesn't have, have a ton of value. So it's brutal. And, and I point your, your listeners to a, a great paper written by um, a former colleague, uh, Professor Rebecca Chez and uh, Professor Jay Whitaker, when, when Rebecca was a a PhD student in his group that that went through these unit economics in painful detail, and and this this you know was prescient because this was written in like 2016. So the value of standard recycling of LFP is is real hard, but there's a, a silver lining. LFP, uh, one of its saving graces, it's really robust stuff. It doesn't change its molecular composition all that much as it cycles. And so now a very low TRL but exciting technology comes into play called direct recycling. And direct recycling says, why do we have to take this cathode and digest it to its core components. Why can't we just refurbish the cathode or rejuvenate it? And so I think if LFP recycling is gonna have a shot, it's going to be on a direct recycling route. And and for those that know me and get a beer with me after conferences, they're probably doing a spit take because I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of direct recycling in a lot of ways. I think that for nickel, um, for NMC uh, uh, compounds, it's, it's really difficult and it's just cheaper and safer ultimately for guaranteed lifetime to break it down to sulfate or something similar or in a mixed uh, hydroxide precursor and build it back up. But I think for LFP to be economically viable, direct recycling likely has to be the option uh, where the cathode comes in and instead of being digested, it is um, thermally treated in similar processes to making the cathode material to begin with. So, so far, as we've been talking about the unit economics and and the technical pathways, actually, I think we've mostly been talking about recycling cathode materials and cathodes themselves. We haven't really talked about the anode, which is where you have graphite or maybe some silicon or lithium, if it's a lithium metal battery or something like that. Um, what what is the what are the similarities and differences on the on the anode side? This is a hard question. Uh, the carbon. Is, is pretty robust stuff, uh, but it's not as, I'm gonna use a fancy word here, immutable, right? Uh, I'm a professor of metallurgy and I've studied metals my whole life because you, you can always screw up with metals and start over. You can always break something that has metallic ion uh, uh, or a metal in it, a metal element in it. Uh, you can break it down through any of the methods we've spoke about and build it back up. And it's very easy to do so. It's much harder to recreate the right structure out of carbon, even if you have a lot of carbon. So we're, we're seeing this play out. Uh, uh, the, the prequel to the story on graphite recycling is just in, in where we're going to source graphite to begin with for first use. Not all graphites are created equal, and uh, there can be a whole other podcast on on the history of different graphites in the lithium ion battery. The, the small differences in composition and starter material have a big impact on, on how the, the performance plays out. Uh, long story short, graphite recycling is in, in its infancy, and it's pretty difficult to, to justify from a purity and hom- homogeneity basis. And 
you know, frankly, there, there, there's plenty of graphite in the ground. So, so it's, it's hard to justify from an economic basis uh, 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 recycling of graphite. We certainly want to do it from an environmental basis, right? We want to be able to recycle all of the components. Uh, silicon is, is a bit easier to process and refine, but that silicon is mixed with significant amounts of carbon to begin with. And silicon is, I think, the most abundant solid <laughs> on the Earth's surface. So, so there's plenty of it. There's a, a, a duality in thinking about, about silicon anodes uh, in 2024. Um, the best performing, or at least the fanciest silicon anodes, come from a process called chemical vapor deposition, where you need to start with silane anyway. Taking spent silicon batteries and processing them back to silane is, is something that, that is doable, and it's a pretty good source of, 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 of silicon for that process. But again, starting with silica, uh, there's not a, there's not a big shortage of that, and and it's the making of the silane, which is uh, the expensive part, um, and most of that is 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 done in China except and, and Korea, except for a, a couple of facilities in, in the very northwest corner of the country. Uh, with lithium metal, well, you know the, the the lithium metal is the same lithium that's in the rest of the battery, and this can be extracted and refined using all of the processes that we've uh, discussed uh, previously. And, and there are a lot of clever ways of getting lithium out in both uh, hydrometallurgical and, and, and pyrometallurgical processes. So, so as far as those three anode choices go, carbon most likely won't be recycled anytime soon. Silicon has some merit being recycled, and all of the lithium that's in cells should be recycled uh, to nearly 100. All right. So I guess final question, the sense that I'm picking up from all this discussion is that you think, I mean, you're pro battery recycling, certainly think that there are fairly well-known and well-trodden pathways to do it, but you have a healthy dose of skepticism around the business of battery recycling. Am I, am I sort of picking that up right? And like, give, give me your high level take on what the battery recycling business looks like in five or 10 years. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I think we're at, we're at a, a market inefficiency now with battery recycling. And, and, and I am a, a process engineer by training, right? Like, like uh, I'm a professor, right? So th those who can do, those who can't teach. So, so I'm very much someone who has not had to be responsible for, for making this material. And so I, I don't want to be seen as, as underappreciating or nagging on the difficulty of battery recycling. But the truth of it is, is that uh, these primary processes are a cost center. And to your earlier comment, they're high capex and low margin. And battery recycling is, is no different. When I started looking at battery recycling a few years ago, I asked myself, you know, why aren't the big mining companies uh, talking about this in a significant way? Why isn't Rio or FMI or, or Vale? You know, they, they have some uh, text on their websites about this, but, but they're not in the conversation of developing technologies in a significant way. And it, it's, for, it's for a really simple reason. The value of these companies, the, the big assets these companies has, have are, are, are in the ground. Their real estate efforts and their processing operations are to valorize what they already own. And, they, and their process operations are a satisfaction condition. So in terms of their unit economics, it doesn't make any sense for a mining company to involve itself in recycling in a big way in 2024, both because all of the recycling uh, material coming in or most of it is, is scrap, and uh, what's not scrap is a product owned by somebody else. So as difficult as battery recycling is, and we spoke about all of the complexities that, that one has to think about when, when we go through it, it's ultimately something where, where it, it's, it's squeezed from the upstream and downstream, and there's very little uh, margin uh, allowed on either end. So, so in a perfectly efficient market, recycling is just a tolling operation where it is, will exist to an extent that it can keep its costs neutral. And every time there's an advance that lowers the cost of recycling, there will be a year or two where that provider gets to benefit from that extra profit, but then the market will expect lower prices going forward, particularly as we need cheaper and cheaper batteries. Well, Dan, thanks so much for walking me through all the ways to recycle batteries and all the reasons it's going to be difficult to to turn it into a good business. Um, we'll, we'll keep you posted and have you back on when direct recycling becomes the uh, state of the art. 
I would love to be proven wrong on the economics of, of the process. I think recycling has to happen. And if the economics uh, were rosier, I think it would happen faster. And so, and so I would love to be wrong about this. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much for having me. Dan Steingart is the chair of the Earth and Environmental Engineering Department at Columbia University. This show is a production of Latitude Media. You can head over to latitudemedia.com for links to today's topics. Latitude is supported by Prelude Ventures. Prelude backs visionaries accelerating climate innovation that will reshape the global economy for the betterment of people and planet. Learn more at preludeventures.com. This episode was produced by Daniel Waldorf. Mixing by Roy Campanella and Sean Marquand. Theme song by Sean Marquand. I'm Shale Khan, and this is Catalyst. Catalyst.